we had a magnitude 7.8 earthquake <laughs> hitting one day when we are 50 meters away from the summit. So you can't obviously plan for that. No, you can't. And that's the acts of God. You know, uh, working with NASA, uh, although I am uh, the director of the SETI Institute, I uh, my grants are coming from NASA, so I'm a NASA contractor. And every time we go to those environments, we have to go through the rigorous process of training with NASA and checking all the boxes for safety. So they are training and training and training us. And I have to thank them because a lot of those trainings are the things that are in your brain when this kind of things happen. You know how to react and you are not freaking out. But in all of the things they are training us for, you have the green risk, the yellow risk, and the red risk. So the green risks are basically the don't be stupid and don't do the kind of thing you wouldn't be doing at home, like it's jumping, you know, on rocks that are not stable, you can tweak your ankle, you know. And then you have other risks like high altitude sickness, how you prepare for that, how you recognize that. These are the yellow risks. And then the red risk. The red risks are what they call the acts of gods, the kind of thing that they can happen you know there is nothing you can do about it, and then you accept that when you do that. So those are volcanic eruptions when you're in this kind of environment, earthquakes, and everything that, and avalanches, for instance. So you're in this giant mountain, and it's shaking. No, it's not shaking. That's the interesting part of it. Um, there was a whole background of things that happened that day when we, we started off, but we got to 50 meters uh, from the summit. And I have part of my logistics team that is at the foot of the mountain. And being so close to the summit, we have to go under an overhang of lava. So it's just like we are just under this big vault uh, of lava, and it's actually beautiful. Uh, if you want something beautiful, it's the Altiplano seen from 20,000 feet. It's just absolutely stunning. What's the colors? What are we looking the at? The colors are that of early earth, which means primordial earth. It's ochres, yellows, oranges, browns, uh, with a dark blue sky. And so you're just, you know, it's a time machine. You're just out there and you're climbing 42 degree slopes. So all of a sudden, uh, I'm right next behind the guide. Uh, and the guide has been with us, it's family, you know, we've been together for 10 years. And he's starting to do that. I don't discuss. Uh, when uh, Macario do that, you know, I, I listen and I ask the team to do the same thing where maybe half a dozen. And then I went to talk to him and say, what's going on? He's on the radio. And then he uh, gives me the radio. I'm talking to my logistic chief officer who was at the bottom. And he said, we're having a tremendous earthquake. Uh, he was saying that the, uh, actually the ground was waving. It was so bad. And he was freaking out because he said, everything is avalanching. And I'm very puzzled because we are in a very dangerous part of the volcano. Nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. I turn around. And then this is when I realized there is dust absolutely everywhere. Everything that I saw two minutes before, it's gone, just disappeared into a wall of dust. But nothing's happening where we are. And uh, our, our friends down, uh, they were freaking out because they were seeing everything avalanching, and especially the other side of the mountain we were on was avalanching. So they have no visuals? Of they have either. no visual. They thought that we are caught in the avalanching. So I said, <laughs> no. But some, uh, uh, so at that point, I so said- they thought you were screwed. Yeah. And I said, okay, so if this is what's happening, then I'm taking everybody to the summit because we have a very large crater that will take care of avalanching, will be safe. And I'm waiting for the aftershock because this is what you do. Uh, you know, uh, when you have earthquakes. So here we go, taking everybody in the crater. And now you have half a dozen scientists in the crater with the crater lake. Uh, and uh, this is wh why we came for. So we just had a 7.8 earthquake. And what do you think they do? Well, of course, they do the science they came to, to do. So the only thing is that I couldn't because uh, my radio was only working when I was on the rim of the crater. But I had a, a little assistant with me, uh, a, a young uh, Bolivian teenager. He had been shadowing me for uh, three weeks, so he knew exactly what to do. And he said, Natalie, don't, no problem. Give me your bags. I'll do the sampling for you. So I was monitoring uh, the situation. And- um, Are you scared? 
I wasn't at that point. And there was another moment, my friend downstairs, I could, you know. Uh, at the foot. Uh, at the foot, foot. yeah. We've known each other. As I said, we're family. This team is family. We've known each other. I am the godmother of kids, so we, we, we are close. And I could feel for the first time in, in my life that he actually was scared. And he was calling me every 30 seconds, telling me stuff. I said, you have to stop this now. Just call me to give me information that is useful for me to make decisions. And so... Um, I say, okay, what's going on? All right. He tells me, you know, there is still avalanching, et cetera. And then a few minutes later, he calls me and say, I think that last car is erupting. So now I have to tell you, we are on a volcano. The next volcano, we share a slope with it, is a, low, a little lower, but that's the most temperamental volcano of the entire chain. And this one has a history of eruption. And then my friend is telling me that the volcano seems to be starting to erupt. If that volcano goes off, we have nowhere to go. That got my attention. So if you say scared, I would say that I got the realization that what that meant. I went cold for like a fraction of a second, but that meant that just my adrenaline started to kick in. And it was a very, very strange experience because now you have tunnel vision, it's about survival. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, now you are going to tell me what I need to know, you know, Tell me, what do you see? He say, I see smoke. I say, what kind of smoke? He say, it's white. I say, no big deal. That's water vapor. Okay, where is it going? It's going to Argentina. That was the opposite direction mm -hmm. of where we are. I said, okay, I'm staying where I am because right now there is no, you know, uh, no danger. And there was still the issue of the aftershock. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to have the team caught in the gully, in the central gully of the volcano with an avalanche coming at us. So we stood there. And he called me after that and said, well, you know, it's still going to Argentina. Fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then a little later, he calls me and say, Natalie, um, things are changing here. I say, okay, what's going on? I say, well, th the cloud is a little yellow. And I was thinking myself, <laughs> what does it mean when it's yellow? Sulfur. And then when you have sulfur mixed with the uh, water vapor or the water in your lungs, this turns into sulfuric acid. Then you're really screwed. And I say, okay, um, where... <laughs> Thank you for the information. Where, where is the club go going? He said, the wing is shifting. It's coming your direction. Oh, no. So yeah, that was a day like that, you know. And... I am talking to him on the radio and I'm turning around. And as I turn around, I see the clouds starting to pop on the opposite side of the rim. You know? So at that time, we had no choice anymore because now you have to figure out what's going to kill you first. And so there was the risk or the potential of an avalanche. But at least you can see the rocks. The gas is going to kill you before you can see it. So I called everybody back. We got our stuff. Um, I didn't give too much detail, but I said it's time to go downhill and fast. So, which we did. We stopped only when we were at mid camp. Uh, and then at that point, we saw the cloud just completely covering the summit where we were. So we did well oh, to bail out. Wow. But that was 500 uh, meter. Wow. 500 meters higher than we were, so we are safe. I was just making sure that it would not go down the slope where we were, where we are safe. So we stayed and, uh, you know, just rested for a little while. And after that, we descended. And it was all on adrenaline. I can tell you what, I had two of my crew with headaches. Part of one of them was because of the altitude we climbed really fast. The other one was because of the cloud. She was the closest to the cloud when uh, it happened. So we descended fast. Wow, that was close. Uh, that was close. And it's interesting how the human body and mind works, because I know that from the moment my friend told me that the volcano seemed to be erupting, I was going on adrenaline. Um, but when we got close to them and I saw him, we were getting close to the cars, I saw him coming towards me and the slope, all of a sudden, all the adrenaline went away. I was a mess. I had to find the first rock and sit down. It was gone. 
I mean, it's fascinating. So you just basically <clears throat> physically and mentally collapsed once Absolutely. you saw. So there was interesting. nothing left of me. I got in the car and I felt in the car as we were heading back towards a camp, I could have passed out. I really fought back and I'm not the kind of passing out really, you know, easy, but there was nothing left. I had no energy, no nothing. It's fabulous how you react and how this is embedded in your brain from eons of evolution, of reaction to a dangerous situation, basically. The drive to survive. Yeah, something like that.